All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, so we've uh, survived uh, Valentine's Day. Always a you know traumatic experience for most people, I think. Uh, <laughs> memories of of elementary school and we didn't get the uh, candy from the cute boy or girl that you had a crush on uh, and other worse experiences. Um, yeah, so uh, we are uh, this morning going to meditate for about 20 minutes. And then uh, I might actually talk about love uh, just as a kind of um, to be timely, you know. If I were Wes Nisker, I would have a very funny uh, talk about love, but unfortunately, I am not Wes Nisker. Um, so, uh, anything else I should say before we begin? I see people are still still arriving in the uh, waiting room. So it's nice to let people show up. Um, it was the, oh, I, I actually was, um, over the weekend, I was going through the copy edits on my book, Living Kindness, which is no longer available. <laughs> it's uh, in process with Shambhala Publications. We're gonna release it in their own edition. Actually, maybe people would be interested to see the cover that uh, we've agreed upon. So just for fun, while we are getting ready here, I will um, share my screen and you can see what the cover looks like. Kevin, does that mean the original version is going up in value? That's exactly right. It is a collector's item officially. So here, definitely. Okay. So here's the uh, new cover, Ooh. which I, I really like. I I liked the just flatness of the text. Uh, non, what do they call it? Uh, sans serif, without a ser serif, and they added a little tagline down here, exploring the Buddhist suttas on care and compassion. They also changed the uh, subtitle. Uh, to, from it was before it was uh, Buddhist teachings for a troubled world, and they changed it to meta practice for the whole of our lives. Um, has the same rhythm actually, uh, but there you are. And uh, see if I show you the other one, where well, you can see it over here, that, that that was the alternative. Then you'll be like, oh wait, I like that one more. <laughs> but I uh, I chose the uh, because this is serif right it's like it's it's got loops in it around the ends of the letters and that's this is not so this i i like the flatness of it i don't know why it's my my uh flat personality or something where okay what am i doing here uh i have to stop sharing stop stop oh there it is Okay, well, oh, geez, I wonder, will people see that in the recording? I don't know. We'll never know. Well, somebody will know. Um, so, again, good morning. And um, let's, uh, let's sit. So if you are new to meditation, just to suggest that you sit in a way that you're really quite upright. Although we want to be comfortable, you don't want to be too comfortable where we're going to get drowsy. So being really upright, so the posture, um, is very al aligned, so there's kind of balanced. And you want the chest to be open so that the breath can 
easily move in and out of the body. And you can close your eyes or just lower your gaze, whichever way is more comfortable for you. And let's start with just some simple body awareness. Oh, I like to scan from head to toe. Oh, there. You can also do toe to head, but uh, I like to start by relaxing the muscles in the face, relaxing the jaw. Softening the eyes. Moving the tension downward so that you can release the shoulders if there's any of hunching in the shoulders. And the hands can be on the thighs or in the lap. Just resting. Opening the chest, softening the belly. And there you can Feel the breath. As it lifts and expands, and falls and contracts. Relaxing through the hips and pelvis. And just feeling the legs and feet. And one helpful kind of felt visualization, if it's if that is a possible thing is to kind of imagine that any tension or stress is draining out of the body downward, out the toes into the earth. You can have that sense repeatedly as you exhale. So just letting the breath out slowly and letting all that energy drain into the earth. Letting the breath now return to its normal pace, whatever that is in this moment. Just feeling the body breathing. And you can start to aim the attention at a particular point of sensation either at the nostrils where the air comes in and out, the touch sensation there, or at the belly, the rising and falling with the breath.
And this then becomes the anchor for the attention place to which we return whenever the mind wanders, place where we can rest our awareness, just enjoying the simplicity, only the elegance and beauty of breath. power of life. Perfectly designed to sustain our bodies, to interact with the environment, with the atmosphere. This intimate relationship Breathing in and breathing out. Thich Nhat Hanh suggests we add a half smile as we sit. See what happens if you do that. Does that change your felt experience? Or is there resistance to that? Is there joy in that? Along with mindfulness of breath, we can breathe into the felt experience, into the joy or resistance, whatever mood state is there, how that's being experienced, pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. We breathe with that. The breath keeps us grounded in the present moment. The, the feelings reveal this other layer of experience. beyond simply the body, this vital layer that so influential in our thinking and our behavior. If we're not aware of our underlying feelings, then we're just being triggered by them unconsciously. So as we breathe with them, we welcome them in, into consciousness. Hold them with kindness, with openness, with acceptance. But 
and a half smile helps us to feel them, to feel them as natural. Just energy is passing through these feelings. Whenever we notice the mind has got wrapped up in thinking, we acknowledge that. Again, bring the smile. Thoughts are so predictable in so many ways. Our minds take themselves very seriously. But with wisdom, we can see the humor in it all and come back to the breath.
All right. Uh, welcome again. Um, uh, I'm going to um, put another link in here um, for the upcoming retreat. Excuse me. We're still finalizing our uh, the details of registration, but uh, but we've got the dates and um, the cost, which is uh, which are kind of the key things. So, if you are interested in coming on a Buddhist recovery retreat. That's a link to the flyer. And um, uh, Debbie, uh, is Debbie on here? Debbie is going to be one of the, oh, there she is. Hi, Deb. I'm here. <laughs> Hello. She's yeah. going to be sharing the teaching seat with me and Greg Pergament, who teaches uh, Qigong along with Dharma. So um, looking forward to it. And uh, so if you've never been on one of those retreats with us, they're kind of a hybrid of an intensive Buddhist or silent retreat with uh, a certain amount of um, interaction, kind of very intentional uh, workshop and uh, meeting each day. Um, so glad we're able to offer that. Um, usually we just have one in the fall, but we're trying to trying to at least have one in the spring and one in the fall there in Northern California. So, um, uh, so I thought I would uh, draw from my uh, book of daily reflections. Um, and actually read from yesterday because it's the, de the topic of February 14th is love. Um, and, and this kind of uh, uh, sums up and kind of draws from uh, my book, Living Kindness, that I was talking about before. I'll just read this section, this one page. Addiction is an expression of hatred hating ourselves, our feelings, the world, and those around us. It's a rejection of life. The healing of recovery is, in the words of Buddhist author William Alexander, an awakening to love. We discover the richness, beauty, and fulfillment available in life. We discover our own inner goodness. Love, though, is a word that has lost a lot of its meaning in our culture. It can mean lust, obsession, or simply liking something a lot. When the Buddha describes loving kindness, he says, even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish every living being. He equates a mother's love more with care and protection than affection. While a loving mother might at times get quite annoyed and frustrated with her children, she will always care for them. To be clear, this is an archetype. We know that some mothers fail to care for their children. What happens if we change our idea of love from affection to protection and care? Affection and passion tend to fade and in romantic relationships are often driven by sexual craving, which also tends to fade. But if what guides our love is caring for someone, it's not subject to the same dissolution. In the same way, if we think of our love for ourselves as caring rather than approving, we can avoid the pitfalls of self-judgment and disparagement. 
none of us is perfect. So there is always something to judge or disparage. If we view ourselves through this lens, we walk around despising ourselves. If on the other hand, we think of loving ourselves as taking care of ourselves, then we eat when hungry, rest when tired, and seek comfort when troubled. In this way, we aren't loving ourselves because we've earned love or done something special, but just because we are human and need care. Today, reflect on ways you can care for yourself better. What if you thought of yourself as a vulnerable young child who needs protection? How would you treat yourself then? How would you treat others if you saw them as children as well? So this is sort of, you know, a part of the whole theme of, of my book, Living Kindness, is, is trying to find uh, a way of thinking about love that isn't uh, uh, particularly self-love, <laughs> that, that isn't about like earning it and having to be good enough. And as I say, we're, none of us are perfect. So we can always find some way of criticizing ourselves. And, you know, that, excuse me, well, that doesn't really accomplish anything, does it? You know, it <coughs> just creates this cycle of, of self-judgment and, and, and negativity towards ourselves. You know, and, you know, we can sort of sit around going, well, I deserve it or something. But like, again, like, what's the point? Like what, as if, as if we are responsible for punishing ourselves for our own failings, like karma will take care of that. It already has taken care of that. So you don't have to, you know, uh, become your own jailer or your own, you know, sentence yourself. Uh, be the judge of yourself. But rather this idea, and, it, you know, it, uh, there's an element, we could say, of not self in this, uh, sort of the, the view that we can kind of s mentally separate ourselves from ourselves, <laughs> because there isn't sort of a self there, so that there's sort of consciousness and, and awareness, and then that we see that there is this mind-body experience going on, right? There are thoughts and feelings, there are memories, there are hopes and plans, there are regrets, and and it, you know, that that whole container, you know, can be viewed in this judgmental way. Oh, look at all the the flawed things in this mind body you know or it can be seen as just a being who has tried to survive existence <laughs> that's a very general statement but but you know that's kind of our starting point right i'm just trying to get through this thing called life and even if we don't think of it as I'm, try, I'm to do and trying to do my best, I'm just trying to get through it. And, and I, th I think I can say that, that most of us are trying to get through it without suffering any more than we need to, you know, that's kind of, we want to be happy, you know? And, and so then we can look at this our, at ourselves objectively and say, you know, am I doing what, you know, am I functioning in a way that's moving towards happiness? Are these thoughts leading me towards happiness? Are these feelings expressions of happiness? Are these actions things that are, you know, going to bring more happiness? And if we are, if those thoughts and feelings and the things we say are driven by self-judgment and the idea that we're not okay, then will be moving in this direction away from happiness. Yeah. So it's kind of, you know, it's kind of like we have the choice. Uh, you know, if we want to define ourselves 
as not okay, and then thereby punish ourselves or somehow live that out. When Once we realize that that's happening, once we have that objective view, then we are actually making the choice. And so it's important for us to see that there is a choice, first of all, right? Because most of us, before we attain any mindfulness or awareness, don't realize that we are making choices in this way. And so when we wake up, at least to that degree that we can see, oh, thought, that thought is, is just a belief, right? It's just a, a, a constructed thing that it, it could be looked at completely differently. And sometimes we're very surprised when we get feedback from other people who say, oh, I think you're really, really nice. <laughs> you think, but I think I'm, you know, a jerk or whatever, you know, and you realize that your self view is just a construction and that others could have a completely different construction. So then that, this is the beginning of what's called freedom in Buddhism, right? Because it's freedom to actually control our fate in a, to some degree. Obviously, we can't control everything, but to, but to be able to see like, I, just to see, as I say in this, this passage, just to see that I'm just a human being. And what does, if I just look at myself as just a human being, not as myself, but just as a person, and if I, and if I bring in an attitude of compassion and kindness, which probably, you know, I have towards most people, unless they've harmed me in some way or there's something going on, some resentment. But if I just treat myself as just some generic person, well, my tendency is going to be, oh, you know, I hope you're okay, you know, and what, and maybe even, you know, how can I help you to be okay? And so we, we can ask ourselves that question, kind of the question of the day, every day. <laughs> How can I help myself to be okay today? What do I need to do? And so that then gives us our intention, right? In Buddhism, right intention, it kind of sets us on a path. Okay, instead of deciding that what I need to do with myself is decide if I'm worthy of being happy or of, uh, you know, having a life that I like, I'm going to put that question completely aside and say, that's not really even on the table. The question is just going to be, how can I make this life be pleasant? How can I help this person to have a, a life that's meaningful and joyful and, or even just okay? So then you wake up in the morning, right? And each choice and each decision from that time it can be driven by that. So you wake up, you think, okay, now should I go and have a drink? <laughs> is that going to start my day? Well, is that going to get me going? Well, or should I lie here and contemplate all the stupid things I've done in my life and all my regret? No, I don't think that's going to make me happy. Maybe I'll get up and um, drink some tea. <laughs> and maybe, oh, what would be a good way to prepare my mind for the day? Oh, I remember I, I could meditate. Yeah. What if I started my day by meditating and watching my mind and bringing a, a gentle kindness to myself? And then I'm like, you know, I'm kind of hungry. Uh, maybe I should have a double cheeseburger. And then I think, you know, Maybe that's not really the, the best way to treat my body uh, as my, maybe later, <laughs> but maybe I'll start with something a little gentler, you know, and then it's like, you know, I'm feeling kind of, oh, wait, you know, I really need to, need to make some money. Should I go to work or should I just, you know, quit my job? I think, no, you know, maybe I could go to work, you know, and so that our day goes, right? We're making choices just, uh to take care of ourselves, to be kind to ourselves. Uh, 
and and then you know and then the thought arises i am such an idiot we do something make a mistake at work or we hit a bad golf shot or something and it's like i am such an idiot what is wrong with me and if there's awareness you see oh that's just a voice those are just words in my head that is not information <laughs> you know that is not uh, you know I am not getting the the words of God into my ears. Oh, I'm an idiot. Oh, what should I do? No, we realize, wow, there's this part of me that's, you know, harmed, that's that's hurt, that or that is angry or is whatever it is, you know, even to analyze it. I don't know what it is, but this part of me that that says these mean things to myself and it hurts. So if I were wanted to take care of this person who's having mean things said to them, what would I do for them? I think I'd say, don't listen to that mean person. You know, you're not a jerk. You're okay. So, okay, I'm going to say that to myself. I'm not going to listen to those thoughts. I'm just going to say, thanks for sharing, uh, but no. And I'm going to come back to this moment, come back to my breath, and do whatever I need to do to let it go. Take the right, next right step, as we say, you know, the next right action. So this is what I call living kindness, right? It's, it, 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 it kind of takes us out of having to deal with the word love <laughs> and like figure it out. And it points to, it's not a meditation. No, uh, it's, it's not just, it's not a feeling. It's not just like, oh, I feel so much love. Feelings are impermanent. <laughs> you know, they come and they go, you know. No, it's a way of living, of being. And it involves, you know, thoughts, words, and actions. It's all the forms of karma. You know, it's being careful with our mind and being careful with our actions, being careful with our words. And, and it, it does require this certain decision and to take ourselves as just a person that deserves, we could say, to be happy in simplistic terms, or who deserves to be taken care of. You know, I like this idea of care because it's just this kind of simple thing you do that doesn't involve judging, you know? If someone, if you see somebody fall down on the street, you don't go, I don't know, is that person really deserve to get back up? Like, they kind of look like an idiot. I don't really like those shoes they're wearing, you know? No, we don't like judge people if they need care in front of us. We, we just care for them, we take care of them. So if we can treat ourselves in that way, like we're just another person that fell down in the street, you know, who needs to help getting up. And that can uh, really help us um, just, to, just to stay out of this whole cycle. Uh, so important. You know, uh, yesterday we were, we were talking about the, uh, the Angulimala Sutta, this, um, a teaching out of the early Buddhist texts about the Buddha kind of converting this, um, this serial killer and, and he becomes a monk and, and he becomes enlightened, you know, as, as one does in, this, in the suttas. And, uh, but towards the end of the sutta, this monk, Angulimala, he still has to bear the karma of of what he did in this lifetime. So when he goes out on alms round, people are throwing rocks at him and sticks and stuff, and they break his bowl and everything. And he comes back to the Buddha and tells him what happened. And the Buddha says to him, bear it, Angulimala. You know, this is just your karma, that you have, have to have this experience um, because of your karma, but it's really not that bad compared to what would have happened if you hadn't found this path, uh, you know, and, and 
uh, you know, this is true for us as people in recovery. Uh, occasionally, our karma comes back to bite us. Uh, but it, you know, I had this experience recently. Uh, I mentioned yesterday that someone from long ago, who, who's known me before I got sober, uh, and sent me what was clearly a drunken email. <laughs> saying, uh, you know, you think you're so holy now, but I know who you really are. And, and you know, it was hurtful. And, I, and it was, you know, I read it before I meditated in the morning, and then I was meditating, and then I thought about Guli Mala, and I thought, oh, I don't have to beat myself up about something I did 40 or 45 years ago, you know. Um, but I but I have to bear it, you know, I have to just accept it like, oh, this, this is hurts and it's true. And, uh, you know, I, this person's been in and out of sobriety. So they, you know, they, they've actually come to me for spiritual guidance at different times. So it's not like, you know, I, I think there's some big thing that, oh, oops, I, Ah, I didn't realize. No, I mean it's been worked through. But as we know, when people relapse, they kind of that's they don't just relapse in their behavior; they relapse in their minds and go back to the former resentments. But you know, I thought I thought, oh, I could just take this on. You know, I could see how my mind could like it because I don't know about you guys, but there's a a few thousand things I did in the past that I can spend my day reflecting on and feeling like crap about and just thinking, well, you know, I'm, I'm such a, I'm so horrible. Um, But, you know, I look around at my life and I go, well, if I'm so horrible, then how is it that, you know, my karma has brought me to this place where my life is so great. You know, I think that, uh, you know, I'm not going to say that that karma is all taken care of, but, you know, that's not who I am, clearly, you know, um, which is another advantage of not self, right? If if there were a self, I'd still be the person. Well, I guess I'd still be drinking. I don't know. I don't know how it would work if there were a self, but definitely, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, Guy, <clears throat> excuse me, Guy Armstrong, kind of makes this point that we couldn't evolve spiritually if there were a solid self, because we would just be like this person. And that would be, we'd be born that way and we would never grow or change. Um, But, you know, it's one thing to say, bear it, Kevin, you know, and it's another thing to say, bear it, Kevin, because you deserve it. You know, (laughs) it's like, no, I, yeah. I mean, I, I deserve it in the sense that yes, I understand that that harm that harm was done, or at least in this case, it's more like perception of harm. I would, I'm not going to argue that, but I don't want to defend myself in the in the court of karma. Uh, but um, uh, but rather, do I take that on? You know, you know, I can bear it in this moment, but do I do I carry it around for the rest of the day? Bear it doesn't mean I pick it up. It means that I don't fight it. You know, I say, yeah, there's some truth to this and I accept that. And then, you know, I move on. Well, that, that's kind of a divergence from the topic of living kindness, but maybe, maybe not. I think it's a piece of it. So um, that was kind of fun. I'd, um, uh, it's, uh, I, I, I had some... Uh, trepidation this morning thinking about about this class without one breath at a time you know it's it's been i've felt this sort of reliance on that book uh for two years that once i figured out oh i can just go through the book then then i didn't have to worry about the classes in a way so so um so far so good my first post (laughs) post one breath at a time class so I'll open it up. We've still got uh, eight or 10 minutes left. If anyone wants to chime in, say hi, make any comments, judge me, you know. <laughs> Steve, go ahead. Wow. Wonderful talk, Kevin. Um, very timely. <clears throat> uh, 
the daily readings, especially the one this morning, to piggyback on what you were talking about on yesterday's reading, yeah. I'm feeling a sense of freedom. And I, I, you have my vote to dive into a burning desire. It's because, uh, you know, on top of getting a $600 pg and bill for January, which I found criminal, um, my local Huntington Learning Center franchise has gone belly up. And so I'm going to be out thousands of dollars and my grandson's going to be without tutoring. Hmm. And yesterday morning I woke up and I uh, wasn't feeling well. So I tested positive for COVID. So now oh. I'm sitting here with COVID, um, which is okay because, uh, yeah, in the past though, I would be completely freaking out and worrying about everything. But the sense of freedom that I feel because of the practice and the work that we do together and just listening to the talk, and today's reading about worrying. What's the point of worrying? I'm actually finding some happiness because I can't taste the damn thing. And for this food addict, if I can't taste anything, I don't have to eat anything. <laughs> it doesn't do me any good. Just so I can have some levity around it. And this is just the way life goes. This stuff comes and it, it's um, we deal with it. But my, my whole thing on the, uh, for me, for 40 years, I was seeking and trying to find what my higher power was or what it is. And discovering that the Dharma is my higher power comes through studying that book. And let's, mm. let, I, you have my vote to go through the burning desire. Uh, that would take a lot of people to a lot of wonderful places. And I'm, I'm okay. I feel good. And um, the symptoms are mild. And I'll oh, get good. through this. And uh, mm. thank you for your wonderful talk. Uh, it was just a beautiful talk this morning. Thank you so much. Thanks, Steve. I hope you, uh, yeah, hope it stays mild and get well soon. All those stents and everything, you know, not, not great. So, right. Yeah. I'll be good. Okay. All right. People are still coming into the waiting room. How odd. Maybe they have the time wrong. Um, Richie, hello. Uh, hello. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so I, um, there's a couple things. I, we've been talking a little bit about Thich Nhat Hanh lately, mentioning yeah. him. And I don't know if it's appropriate or not, but there's a podcast called The Way Out Is In. Mm -hmm. And Brother Papu, his um, longtime attendant, who's now the abbot at Plum Village. Mm -hmm. The latest pat podcast is called A Cloud Never Dies. Mm -hmm. And it, ju it just moved me so much. It was mm -hmm. just incredible so i don't know if it's, and i you know i have people that might want, want i might want to share it so yeah, why, why don't you put that information in the chat for people well that's why i wanted to say it because yeah, yeah, i'm sure. not good at that i'll try okay, okay. I, yes i will <laughs> i will and i just wanted to mention too when you got to the point in the story when you said bear it it's your karma mm. how my body reacted because it, it was um a sense of relief you know um, because i'm i'm facing like you know multiple lumbar fusions and dealing with a lot mm -hmm. of physical pain and all this kind of stuff and it's oh <laughs> you know okay <laughs> you know and i didn't you know and it wasn't until you spoke about it that i you know that that how that could be taken negatively right. but to me you know it's just like like you said like not fighting it yeah you know, and, yeah. and, and, you know, I've been, you know, I've been doing pretty well. And the, um, you know, the no, the no mud, no Lotus phrase also from Thich Nhat was, was something yeah. that I found very helpful, but it, it was interesting because I had a somatic reaction when, mm -hmm. when you said that, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, of course, you know, I, I've been thinking a lot for a while now that it's all about love you know, and and um, so the old Earth, Wind, and Fire song keeps keeps going through my head. <laughs> but um, you know, and and how it doesn't change, and and you know, I have a daughter that's been through her own addiction, and there's been so much you know trauma and all kind of things, and um, you know, she, I sent her a thing. She sent me a thing about about lo a very loving. A message and i sent her back that you know well know that you're loved too and that that, that that's never changed you know mm -hmm. so yeah. uh and, yeah. and i and i like the way you you 
you know, you talked about it. It's 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 a way of life, and um, and I totally agree with um, the self talk. Mm -hmm. I have an eighty three year old piano student who's constantly telling herself <laughs> how <laughs> stupid she is and how she can't do this. And oh like, God! And tell her really? like you know, well, you know, and I just say you know, yeah. What would you? What would you do? If somebody else said that to you? <laughs> yeah, really. So anyway, I don't want to take up too much time. Thank you for yeah, me. thanks, Richie. So uh, technically, you know, this technically goes until eleven, but I will hang out until I've answered all the questions with people's hands that are raised. So just in case you're wondering, uh, but I know that some people have to leave uh, at eleven, so. Um, I'll try not to be offended. So um, the next person I see with their hand up is Catherine T. Hello. Hello. How are you? That was really beautiful. Right. Lovely. I didn't know what to expect coming in today, you know, since you've done your book. And uh, it was perfect. It was just oh, good. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I actually came in like right when you were on step 11 of the book. So kind of on the later phase of your Zoom classes, we're so grateful to have found you. Um, I know you don't I I've seen I went to the retreat with you so like I got oh that's right right of course yeah I got I, burning desire and then uh -huh. I was like oh what's this all about and then I found your zoom classes and you know I'm going on two years of sobriety now very good um, ended up getting this too but, um, okay. anyway, I've been diving deep into my Buddhist practice and it's been really wonderful and you've been very inspiring so thank you um, on Saturday, I ended up doing a day-long retreat with Jack Cornfield online. Which oh, I yeah. Yeah, I saw he did that. And he brought up the half-smile thing that same day, so I wanted to touch on that. <laughs> right. There's definitely some defiance I have. Like, uh -huh. I'm not in a depressed state right this moment, but I'm almost like, mm, I don't want to have to smile. So it's just, can you right. touch on, like, the resistance or the defiance around the half-smile stuff? Yeah, don't, don't, don't get into an argument with yourself. Just don't bother. You know, if it's if it feels like a resistance, don't worry about it. It's not necessary. It's I just a, it. It's kind of cool like, to kind of give it a little test. It, it's interesting how you, you wouldn't think it because I'm, you know, that would be my normal reaction would be resistance to it. But for some reason, when I was introduced to it, I was open to it. It, I get, it was a retreat in the late eighties when I first encountered it. And, and I was just so shocked how it made me feel better, like instantly. And it, it seemed like, cheap you know what i mean like yeah. it can't be that easy it's like people who say oh just think positive i'm like screw you don't tell me to think positive you know you don't have to be so so uh, so i don't uh, you know it, it's just whatever it is what it is and use it as it if it works but uh you know it's and it doesn't always work there are times when the feelings are you know just i, I like it particularly for laughing at myself. I use it during the day when I have like some ridiculous thought and I go, <laughs> you know, that's ridiculous. And then, so I, so then I smile at myself rather than, you know, beat myself. <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, I also see like, sense this, I kind of want to like, oh, I just want to meditate, however it works. Because how I, I first started meditating without any real instructions. So now I'm getting instructed. I'm like, I kind of want to defy and resist and it's like oh no so i'm trying to learn now to really be open to the instruction and, uh -huh. and yeah i mean I, and and at the same time every instruction isn't going to be the one for you you know there are many different approaches and you have to find your own approach um you know, the only mistake you can make is to not meditate at all <laughs> if you want to defy that no, no thanks. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, nice to see you, Kevin. Tim, hello. Yeah, hi, hi, Kevin. Thanks. I uh, yeah, I appreciate this. Uh, you know, speaking of self compassion, it's kind of a new thing for me. I don't know. I just didn't. Uh, maybe it was I had toilet training or something. I, I didn't seem to get it. You know, coming up. Uh, but I'm I'm not. Someone's trying to figure it out what happened, but uh, you know, uh, how do I make peace with my inner critic? Mm -hmm. you know, I have this, uh, for instance, I have this painting practice, and uh, you know, I'm painting this painting, and I'm, I'm kind of struggling, and all of a sudden I hear this uh, 
is saying, uh, you can't paint me. You can't paint me. Mm. And uh, I used to just run away from that, you know, fight, flight or fight. Yeah. Fight or flight or freeze up. Yeah. And uh, I, it might be something to do with the uh, sitting. I, I'm able to kind of sit with it now. Mm. But um, any advice on, I guess, advice is chief, right? How do you uh, make yeah. peace with your inner critic? Yeah, I, I mean, a really good question. And, and that's a great example, you know, as, as an artist. Um, it's such a common issue, you know, uh, that kind of blockage, the self-judgment blocking the creative process. And, and yeah, the sitting, I mean, to me, mindfulness is the key. There may be other ways to approach it, but to me, just being very persistently watching and kind of, I mean, there's a questioning in the watching, just watching the thoughts, in other words, and seeing, you know, what, what are those thoughts What's their evidence? What evidence are they um, using? You know, because uh, they're, if you start to really look at them and question them, they tend to kind of lose their power. They, they really work best in the shadows, unrecognized. But if you keep looking and saying, is this true? Is this really true? You know, uh, and where is this coming from? You know, and not as analysis. I mean, certainly you can do therapy about it. That's one piece of it. But but the mindfulness approach of just seeing it, and because it's it starts to fall apart. You know, the the arguments that your mind is making start to fall apart when they're put under the lens of mindfulness. That you just kind of like. You, they they start to become almost silly, like you real they they are so transparent. You, know, you just realize like oh, this is just like a neurotic thinking, shit. You know, I, it's it's, and so then out of that, you, you know, the, so that's the mental part, the cognitive part. Then there is this felt part, the somatic as was mentioned, and. And, uh, you know, so it's felt in the body, it's, it's, it's felt in the body, but it's, you know, it's emotional as well. So it's, it's to see that, that those thoughts hurt and to take a, an attitude towards that pain of gentleness and of kindness to kind of treat the pain as you would treat a child who's crying, you know, who's being, who's suffering and hold that. So you breathe with the feelings and you, oh, this hurts. Don't, and don't let it build a story, you know, but because it, it can go back into the, the trigger back into the negative thinking there, but to breathe with it and just let it, come and see that if you just breathe with it without trying to fix it and without trying to push it away, which is really important, that it actually fades on its own. There's a calming, the breath just calms the feelings quite naturally. If we just kind of hold them without any kind of attitude of this has to change, you know, or that I have to build a story out of this. So this is the, the the somatic part of it, the breathing with it and allowing it. And, and then if it's if we're not feeding it with the thoughts and we're approaching, we're giving space and allowing the feelings to be there, it's that naturally moves into compassion and and a different space around the whole thing. Mm, that's great. So uh, allowing is what I heard. Yep. Uh, very much okay. very much yeah thanks tim oh good nathan i saw you had a a question too in the uh yeah 
thank, thank in the you. chat about yeah. Oh, um, right. Yeah, I had in the chat. I was just kind of putting it out there, looking for um, in-person gatherings yeah. around the East Bay or Berkeley. Yeah. Good. Um, what's it called? This, this is the second time I've attended one of your Zooms. I uh -huh. just want to introduce myself and say thank you for, yeah, for the talk today and that, that it is, yeah, it, it resonates with me real deeply. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's just been a thing of mine being incredibly hard on myself throughout my life. Yeah. Um, cur currently, I, right, I just got back from four, like a work study retreat at Esalen four oh. weeks. And nice. I, um, I, I met somebody while I was there and it was so, so beautiful to just kind of let it unfold very naturally. And uh, the transition back to the East Bay, we both we both live in the East Bay, luckily. Uh, but the trans the transition has been rough, and there's this part of me who's really obsessing, and uh, you know, just with what you were just saying, it is fearful of, of yeah. losing this person, of of messing it up. And um, yeah, I like what you said about just comforting and soothing and um and yeah i ju just wanted to share that yeah ju just to that i've been you know one thing i've done is kind of like hug a pillow and I i've been picturing this like 17 or 18 year old mm. self who's so yeah yeah worried about it so anyway ju just kind of yeah be being okay um with these intense feelings and just wanted to share that with you all. Yeah. Thank you. It's nice to meet you, Nathan. I'm actually in Berkeley myself and uh, which is kind of weird, right? Like, Oh, where are you? Oh, Oh, I'm next door. Um, but uh, you know, not really doing any live teaching yet, unfortunately. Well, the retreat will be live, but um you know, I, this kind of came up, and I, I don't know if this will, how this will land, but, you know, it, it's been, I mean, I've been married for a long time, 25 years. It'll be 25 years this year, actually. And and so in the same relationship for 30 years. And so I'm a little out of touch with romance, like as, you know, as a exciting new experience. And uh, I was pretty addicted to it, you know. And one of the things that I've kind of read about that kind of resonates for me is, is how we can be in a place where we think that the, the feelings that we're getting from being with this other person are dependent upon them rather than we have access to those feelings because those feelings are still within ourselves, but we kind of, we misunderstand where love comes from or where those feelings come from. And that ultimately, you know, has a negative impact on the relationship because it sets up this dependence. We feel as if we need that person to, to be okay, you know, rather than, oh, this is really rewarding to be together. And we, you know, this is a nice partnership or connection. Uh, but it just, uh, you know, it just, when you said, when you talked about like coming back and having that fear of, because I can totally get that because, you know, Esalen is like you're in magic land, you know, and what a place to like meet someone and can, can connect you know, and then you come back, it's like, oh, like traffic and work or whatever, you know, rent and shit. And it's like, oh, and all of a sudden, you know, the, the sparkle is sort of gone. And, um, you know, how it, it comes back to, it's kind of like the difference between loving kindness and living kindness. Now you have to get back into the, the living and, and can you transition into that? And, and uh, I don't know, that's just weird you know, uh, what came up and 
and I wish you well with that. It's a wonderful thing to do to have happen. Uh, uh, thank you, Kevin. That's helpful. Okay. Appreciate it. Thanks. Um, I see one more. Oh, one more hand up, Alex. Are you still there? Yes, you've unmuted. Hello. Hi there. Hi. Um, I've been listening to you for a little while now, to your book. Uh, one breath at a time. Uh -huh. uh, thank you very much for that. Yeah. Uh, but today, I think it was such a perfect uh, theme that you brought it up because, and I don't know if this is a question or a comment, but I was driving, I left the gym at 10 and I wanted to do the meditation. So I drove somewhere to park. Mm. And on the way to the place where I am now, uh, which just for context is that parking lot of a hardware store. Uh, I was drive, driving a little bit fast. I don't know how fast I was driving, but anyway, somebody that was parked, uh, chopping some branches inside of the road, yelled at me, you know, fancy you, you know, aggro, um, and flipped the bird to me. Mm. And I had to stop on the side of the road because I felt right away, I felt this intense physical urge to retaliate. Yeah. 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 And I stopped it uh, on the side of the road and I, I just sat with it because and the first thought, one of the first thoughts that came to me was like, oh, yes, this is perfect because I'm going into the meditation <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to be able to uh, sit through with it mm -hmm. instead of uh, just ruminate and feel bad and feel bad and just like feel anger. And that. So then in the, in the after the meditation or I mean, 10 minutes into the meditation, I kind of forgot about that, which was, it took me a second to get into the forgiveness uh, of that. Mm. Um, but then, um, I, I'm, I felt a lot closer to the experience itself after the meditation and what you shared. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, um, I just want to say thank you for that because it, the reminder of what you shared helped me realize that this is not, uh, I'm, I'm, this is not uncommon and it has nothing to do with what I was feeling in the retaliatory feelings that I was having has nothing to do with the person mm. yeah. itself because I was angry at him and I want to retaliate at him. Mm. And I started realizing that, wow, I, this is this that I'm experiencing is actually in my body. Mm, right. Right. And uh, I was listening in your, in your book earlier about, uh, somebody telling you that meditation is the, f the feeling the goal is to the feeling uh, in the one breath at a time and uh, so mm -hmm. I start I start realizing that I start I, I, I first first of all it helped me realize that I can actually go into the feelings in my body and right. feel where they are yeah. um and then going into it a little bit more, I realized that, oh, wow, he was probably really upset. 
Right. <laughs> for for him to be really angry. Yeah. yeah. He was probably going through something really challenging in that mm -hmm. moment. Yeah. Uh, so if you can comment on that uh, to far to to farther to uh, to help me stretch my awareness into mm. this no, process. I mean, I think you you hit you hit the whole thing. You know, you got it. Like that's that's kind of the process we go through, which is that we start very self-centered in our own reactive state. And if we're able to bring mindfulness to that, we're able to see that it's just an experience that's particularly strong in the body. And when we breathe with it in the body, we step out of the reactivity and out of the story into the felt experience. And then the possibility of another perspective opens up because there's space. We've created space. Like the, the angry mind is constricted. You know, there's no room in there. There's, it's just caught up in, there is just anger. When we let go of that and just breathe with the experience, then uh, space and then uh, opens up. And in that space, other views can appear. And that's exactly what you did, that all of a sudden it, you stepped out of yourself and you started to see this as a bigger picture, like, oh, well, that person was having an experience because you're realizing this is how our own suffering gives us compassion towards others because we realize, oh, what I'm experiencing, other people experience. I'm not, I'm not alone with this. This isn't unique to me. And that's, that's the wisdom that comes out of this uh, this. Uh, awareness, the mindfulness and compassion then open up into wisdom. Uh, so that's beautiful. I mean, you, you really uh, went through a process and it's funny. I mean, I, in living kindness, uh, I kept like using examples of driving because it seems like it's sort of like such a common place for us to get triggered because, you know, when you're in a vehicle, your body knows that you're in danger. You know, when you're moving 20, 30, 40, 80 miles an hour, your body knows, even though your mind, you're not thinking, oh, I could die at any moment. Your body knows like this, my body's moving a lot faster than it's meant to. What is going on, you know? And so it gets triggered into fear, which our reaction to the fight or flight is fight because we're in this aggressive state of movement of controlling this high-speed vehicle. And so a lot of emotions come up, a lot of anger and fear come up in vehicles. So it's a really good place to notice, you know, and people give examples of how to work with that. And in Thich Nhat Hanh talks about using the brake lights on cars to be as, um, or the stop lights as mindfulness bells, just take three breaths uh, when you see the, that and uh, so that's beautiful what you did. I really appreciate you sharing it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And again, yeah. thank you for all what right. you do. Yeah. And uh, uh, someone pointed out, oh, we lost her, that I had, I didn't see that Yvonne had her hand up. So I'm sorry about missing her there. Um, I realize now that it was because of the graphic on her, her um, screen that I didn't see the hand thing in it. I think that's what happened. So I apologize, but hopefully she comes back. Um, well, that was a full day. <laughs> I'm going to be getting paid overtime, by the way, for this. So in case you're wondering, so I appreciate everybody ha hanging out who did hang out. And uh, it's very rich this morning. And uh, I guess I'll start looking at uh, Burning Desire. and We'll start on that on Friday night. Perfect. So, Okay. Um, yeah. So um, hope everyone takes care of themselves, those with COVID, those without COVID. Uh, and uh, may all beings be happy, peaceful, safe. Blessings. Thank you, Kevin. It was a wonderful talk today. Wonderful. Thanks. Thank you, Kevin. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. So, so we'll see great. You. Thank you so Thanks. much. All right. Really Thank you, everyone.
All right. Three, two, one. Thank you, Kevin. Love you.